guys, welcome back to the show, and welcome to episode 175. Sometimes I really, I lose count of these, and I, I, it is amazing for the mood that I'm in, I can smile and say, wow, we've made it through 175 of these. Um, I shouldn't say made it through like it was such a challenge, but I just can't believe I've stayed this consistent on something. Because I just, I've always, life kicks me around and I just, I just want to just throw my hands up and say, screw it. You know, I've really been big on my exercising lately and trying to get into shape and I'm, I'm, I'm sticking with it. I, I got to stick with it like I'm sticking with the podcast. Um, so yeah, thank you guys for being here with me and um, uh, I'll, I'll give you a little update at the end of the show. But uh, again, let's just get to the guests, get to some positivity and then uh, I'll fill you in. Thanks guys. All right, guys, we are back again. Uh, I haven't done one in a minute just because life and just things have gone on, and I've had so many here in the tank that I haven't really needed to go out and get guests. And as I was reaching out to people, someone reached out to me first, and, um, you know, he was very uh, ingratiating me with his uh, story and, you know, just a really sweet guy and just wanted to have him on. And, you know, I'm going through my emotions and honestly kind of what he's promoting and, and what he's into these days could possibly attend, uh, potentially help me. So I was like, all right, this, this may work more than, and than one way. Um, but yeah, like I said, I, I, I his story kind of is parallel with mine in some ways. So I had to have him on. Um, yeah, buddy, you want to like tell us your name a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. Thanks TJ for inviting me to be on your podcast. My name is Paul Zolman and I grew up in, uh, in a uh, in in a remote town in Montana, that uh, were, was my birthplace, and it's uh, the name of the town is kind of kind of just like very well describes the town itself. Glen Dive, and Dive is the key and operative word there. That uh, it was exactly that. It was just not a not a very nice town, and if people are listening that are from Glen Dive, I'm sorry for you. Hmm. But but that, that's, that's where I was born. I was raised in a family of number 10 of 11 children. My father is actually number 15 of 19 children. And so large, large families in my family. My grandfather, uh, that my, my father's father, uh, was in Indiana and had a wife. And, and after the ninth child, I think she passed away from that childbirth. We don't know exactly how, how or why she died, the cause of the death, but she died after that ninth child. My my grandfather was so distraught that that he had an auction of the farm and all of all of the equipment, everything. When people came to that auction, he said, "Would you also like a child?" And he gave away all nine children except for one. And so Benjamin, he took with him to Montana. And he found another wife, married there, and my father is the sixth child of another ten children there in Montana. Wow. And so he, when my father was ten years old, this grandfather passed away. So just imagine the abandonment of the first nine children, and then again, the abandonment for the second ten children. Uh, and there were other issues, other, other things that would compound the abuse that I received when I was growing up in this type of family. I imagine, though, that my father was better than his father and tried to be a better father than his father was. He actually was around, worked at work jobs, and, and was a truck driver, was gone during the week. And then when he returned on the weekend, he, he caught my attention because without fail, every single Friday, TJ, he would date my mother. The place would always be the same. The venue, everything was the same. And may, I imagine it went through the same course of action. My mother would disgorge all the things that happened during the week. And if there was a child that was out of line, that child was going to either get the belt or a severe spanking. 
I remember one time getting spanked so bad. I must have done something horrible getting spanked so bad that my, my rear end was black and blue for more than three weeks. Mm-hmm. It was horrible. At those times, I felt like, you know, this, this isn't going to work. I had a little pocket knife that was probably, a, after it was folded up, it was maybe one and a half inches long, which means that the blade itself was probably one inch long. One point in time, I put that blade to my chest and I thought, you know what? I got to get out of here. I got to just, but I thought about it and I thought about it as I poked it to the chest. It just, oh, that's sharp. I don't want to do that. And then I thought, well, it's only one inch. It's not even going to hit my heart. That's not even going to kill me. It's just going to hurt me. And then if I tell my mom that I hurt myself, she's going to wonder what happened and then They're going to be mad, and I'm going to get hurt even more. So I talked myself out of it and then cried myself to sleep. And that's kind of the situation I was at. Uh, Fast forward several years, and I was in a situation about 15 years ago that I was dating. I was doing destination dating. Do you know what that is? Destination dating. No, what is that? So it's where where you you find a woman that's uh, or someone uh, or uh, uh, someone that you want to date in a different city than you live in you pick a city that you're going to meet in and then you have a date wow okay so i did i did that i, I um had uh, was married and got divorced after 23 and a half years of, of marriage and just was kind of in a midlife crisis and so this was this was my uh, solution for that midlife crisis. I go destination dating. It was great fun. I went to a lot of places. I was living in Charleston, South Carolina at the time, and I went to Daytona Beach, Jacksonville, Florida, Atlanta, Columbia, South Carolina, Charlotte, North Carolina, New York City, Nashville, Kansas City, Salt Lake City, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Phoenix. Snowflake, Arizona, and Cabo San Lucas, of all places. All these places I went for destination dating, but it just never turned out. So I was kind of done with that and living in Phoenix after all that, because uh, that was where one of the ladies was from. I thought it was, maybe it was time to make that relationship go a little farther. It didn't. So my sister saw me at a family reunion and thought I was really lonely. And she had a neighbor that she wanted to introduce to me. This neighbor just, uh, I I told my sister, I said, you know what? I'm just coming off a year and a half of destination dating. A lot of travel, a lot of money that I spent, more than $10,000 on all that destination dating that I'd done. And I didn't want to do it again. Phoenix was seven hours from where my sister's living. And I thought, nah. And then she said, oh, come on. I thought, Oh, well, she's big sister. I have to do what big sister says. So I started corresponding with this neighbor, and and it came to be that we just kind of liked each other and started started uh, having regular correspondence, and then we started talking to each other, and we decided that uh, that it is, we we really liked each other. So for big brother approval, I had to go 300 miles north. I moved up to where my sister was at actually moved to her town and and 300 miles north we went to visit with my brother and for big brother approval first thing that happened when she we walked in is that my sister-in-law pulled her aside and said the only emotion that the zolman family learned growing up was anger at first i denied it then it made me mad Hmm. i thought huh that if that's the perception that's out there about my family, I thought, I've got an opportunity right here now to change that perception. Yeah. But so be- before this the- before this actual you know, encounter with this woman that your sister uh, persisted on you trying or attempting to date, um, why were you so persistent on, like, doing the locational dating? Like, what, was it just because you were dealing with, like, abandonment issues? Was it, like... You seem to be really like wanting to try this out, and it's such a weird, like unorthodox method. Um, Why was it that you really were seeking, you know, the comfort of a person beyond? I mean, was it just 
boredom, loneliness, you know, abandonment issues, all of the above? Well, it could have been all that, but I think more than anything, it was a circumstantial um, effort to change circumstances. Just I wanted a different situation, and I was still I was still living in the town where where the divorce had happened. I was still all those things familiar. I just felt like I needed a change of venue myself. Sure. So I would have actually gone and and moved to a city. Uh, any, any of those cities, I felt flexible enough that I could do that. In fact, that's part of why I moved to Phoenix, because I thought things were moving down the road that way. But that's a really good question. Why did I do that? Uh, I thought that it was just the Internet and the dating websites. This is uh, mid-2000, uh, about 2005-ish, 2006. This, and the Internet and the dating sites were all just so new and so so fresh and and electronically, I could see somebody and, and, and just chat with them. And, and it was just just kind of an interesting time, a new time. It, it seems old hat right now, but it was brand new then to be able to do that. And so that's the, the, just the intrigue that, that now I really don't have to draw a circle around my own town and only date people in my own town. I could see the world. I could go anywhere and find somebody to date in any of those places. So... I thought it was just more intrigue, more the adventure, and like I say, it, it really kind of satisfied the the itch that some people get for midlife crisis. Yeah, for sure. Well, sometimes we're struggling with certain things that we don't really know the answer to, so we just try anything, and you know, sometimes we're trying to go so yeah. so far out of our comfort zone. <clears throat> Excuse me. Exactly. We- I, I think you nailed it, TJ. That we, we'll try anything. So I was trying to read books after I had this incident um, at my brother's house, trying to read books like The Color Code and then uh, and then Five Love Languages. I literally liked the principles, just absolutely loved the principles of the Five Love Languages because to me they, they reconciled to Jesus Christ. And I'm a believer that, that Jesus touched, he spent time with people, he had gifts, he, he uh, had the words, obviously, and he served people. He did all five love languages, and he just did it so easily. And I thought, you know, that's the guy I kind of like to be like, to do do it in that way. So I settled on those principles. The application that Dr. Chapman had didn't work for me. I may, and I know that it's worked for millions of uh, people around the world, but to guess what a, somebody else's love language is and cater to that, uh I grew up in an angry household. I knew that wasn't love, and who am I to say what love is? But catering to someone was felt more like manipulation. It did not feel like love. It didn't feel like it to me. So that didn't work for me. I didn't couldn't see how how could I love someone by just catering to what just what they like. I mean, I could see occasionally, uh, and and possibly regularly, just doing what they like, but it's. But it's all not, not about them. And it just was confusing to me. The second thing that Dr. Chapman has that was confused me, too, is that if you take this survey, you can find out what your personal primary love language would, would be. Hello, TJ. I'm Gift. What do you have for me today? I mean, that sounds just a little bit awkward. And it just, it really is awkward. I, I couldn't see that helping me to know what my love language is. What am I supposed to do? Advertise? Really, how am I supposed to get that love language out to people? So I thought, there's really got to be a better way. So I thought, what if I could make this a game? I liked games as a kid. And so it co- I contacted Dr. Chapman and the team, asked if they were licensing the icons for a new application of the love languages. They said, no, they're not doing that. I said, huh, okay. Well, I, I, I happened to find a, having a friend that was an attorney, copyright attorney, here in town, and he said that that theory is not copyrightable. Application is. So the theory of the love language is not copyrightable. It's the application that's what is copyrightable. So I created my own icons and put them on a die. And this, and so I, I found that this really worked. You know, this really is a, a life changer, a game changer for every, everybody. And pardon the pun for game changer, but it's a it's a game it's a game that everybody wins. You just roll the die every day. That's the love language you give away all day that day. You're giving away, and so the mindset is that you're watching for 
what's right with that person? What can I love about that person? And you'll never have any time to go down the critical path and say what's wrong with that person or, or criticize or be judgmental about a person because everybody has faults. It's boomerang effect. If you send out criticism, I guess that's what you want back. Who wants that? We do it all the time, but who really wants that? They don't think about the boomerang effect. So that this is different. You send out love, and it's going to come back maybe after several days, maybe immediately, but it's not intended in that way. You send it out with any, without any expectation of it coming back, but trust in the process, it will come back. Yeah, no. So that's the, I, I believe that's the what you're saying. Yeah, I just, I, I don't know. Like I said, I, I, I do, for me, I'm always trying to put out good energy and kindness, but, you know, I wouldn't say it always comes back. For me, I'm just my own personal belief, but um, I don't know. I mean, I'm just more cynical than most just because I've been through so much and, um, yeah, yeah, but as you said, it does take time. <clears throat> it's just, it's, it's always been a struggle for me because, like I said, I, I've always been the person in my circle that has tried to keep everybody together. Let's just hang out. Let's do things. Let's try to appreciate life as much as we can because you don't know how long this ride is going to last. And then, you know, I don't know, like for me, especially more lately, like I, I just been looking around, like, like I said, doing this podcast and everything and I love doing it. And, um, I've made so many great friends out of it and I'm always the one that's like, Hey guys, are you all right? I hope you guys are, you know, please let me know, especially cause I know so many people with disabilities and their fluctuation conditions. And, um, but there's a lot of times where I end up, you know, alone in those moments. And when I need people the most, they're not there. And that's where I kind of, I guess, can push back onto what you're saying because just me personally, again, I'm sure what you do works, but, um, I don't know. I, I've, I've spent a lot of time alone in a lot of depression and frustrating moments where I just can't get myself out of my own way because, you know, a lot of my inner thoughts that I struggle with tend to be right, even though I don't want them to be right. Yeah. And I can understand that too, TJ. I, you know, the, probably, probably the best thing that I did when I felt that exactly like that, best thing I've done is try to find someone that felt a little bit worse than I did. And it almost sounds a little crass to try to do that, but they're out there. They're absolutely out there. And if you can find someone that, you, even in, in your in your uh, state of mind right now, you can find someone out there that you can even cheer up. Even with your own attitudes right now, if you can cheer somebody up, guess what's going to happen? That's going to cheer you up at the same time. If you can if you can help someone else be happy, and I'll give you an example of that, and I appreciate your handicap. Uh, uh, I, I, I have used this principle to find someone that's a little bit lower, find, find someone that you can stretch out a hand and lift them up a little bit. And I did this when I was, uh, I was 21 years old. I just come back from Japan for a couple of years in, in Japan. And I was uh, uh, just visiting this, this man in a, uh, he was in a assisted living situation. And he, he was the world champion a wrestler. This was many years ago, but he's a world champion wrestler in the 30s. And he had the cauliflower ears, and he was a Native American Indian. And um, he he was, they called him Chief Little Wolf was his name. And Chief Little Wolf was had had a stroke. So that's why he was in the assisted living. Otherwise, he'd probably be hungry enough to be out on his own. He was in this assisted living, and he couldn't write because he had a stroke, and the hand that was writing before was the side that he had the stroke on. So he had a droopy side, and and he asked me to write letters. At the end of every letter, he'd write, and and we've come to the end of an old Navajo trail, and then he'd have me sign it, Chief Little Wolf, for him. And it was just, just the sweetest experience I had learning about Chief Little Wolf's life by writing letters for him to his friends. And it was just just a, a something that lifted me up every time I did something. And I think service and and having it be about someone else, TJ, if 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 it's if you forget about yourself and think of other people, that's the stepping stone that's gonna help people step out of that depression, step out of that 
that mindset that woe is me. It's out, you're stepping out of, uh, I don't even want to call it a victim mindset, but it's that mindset that says things are bad for you and you're looking inward at that point in time. If it, if you could do the 180 and you turn and look outward at other people and what, what, what problems they're having and try to lift them, just think if people did that, that people that know you, TJ, they'd come right to your rescue and they're, they'd take the time to do it. Part of one of, part of the, one of the five love languages is, is to spend time. That's the day you put the brakes on. That's the day that you spend a little bit more time helping those, lifting those that are, are, are need like that. And I think that's a huge remedy that this facilitates. Now, do you think there's a possibility you can spend too much time on other people and not yourself? Meaning like, I like think, yeah. not just, just because you, you could tend, you could potentially kind of work on other people and be there for other people, but then, you know, at the same time, you're not really doing much for yourself. You're just so concentrated on their feelings and their emotions and, how their life affects them. It's, it's almost like, like I have a friend, he's, he's into Dungeons and Dragons. There's nothing wrong with it, but he kind of loses track of reality because he, he's so into fantasy that he stays in his room and he doesn't come out as much because he just doesn't focus on his actual life. He's not trying to, he wants to, but he just doesn't know how to. So he just figured I'll stay in, I'll stay in this, you know, weird alternate universe where it's safe. Um, and, and in comparison, like for me, like a lot of times I spend so much time on other people there's times where I just go like, man, I didn't even really try to help myself. And I'm like, I'm so worried about other people that I'm not really focused on me anymore. And again, I, it's great to help people. There's nothing wrong with it. I love doing it. But I think sometimes I, I, I lose track of, of me sometimes. I think that's possible. But I think that at the same time that you're helping other people, you are indeed helping yourself. And I really believe that, that with the right attitude about it's all about them rather than anything about you giving giving the gift of love or giving love in any way without any expectation of recipro reciprocity or any expectation of anything ever coming back to you is the, the right attitude to have. If you can get that mindset, and that's what I'm saying, is that this dice really has moved me from a mindset of where I get angry because I felt offended or I get angry because it was that hurt my feelings. Or I get angry because I have these flash moments that uh, I just want to stop the world and, and say, hold on a second, wait a minute. And it's just, it was it was at that point that I thought, you know what? It's not about me. It's really not about me. And if you get, get to that point, that mindset, and I think people can get to that mindset that it's about the good of other people. When you see the good of other people, it, and it's just like that, that boomerang again you see the good of other people express that good to them and help them understand what is good about them eventually that's going to come back to you that's going to they're going to see the good in you and you're going to see the good in you and i think that's going to be satisfactory for you time another thing i'd add to that is that you've got to have meditation time too you have to have time to just a little bit of downtime for yourself to think about about how is this working for you? How is, how is it? And it, uh, and just count those blessings and have some gratitude moments. Those gratitude moments are, are reflective about how blessed you become and what the good things of life that you have. There, you're, when you're in gratitude, in the mode of gratitude, you're absolutely not looking at your problems. You're looking at, you're grateful for those things that are, that are, are blessings to you. Let's go a different route with this, TJ, just for a second. You can take this wherever you want to. But now I, I see that adversity of growing up in that, in that uh, abusive home more as a friend rather than foe. I learned firsthand what's not love. People, there, a lot of people don't ever get to that point, but I learned firsthand what love is not. And some people are, are, have a different way of learning. They learn what's the right thing to do, and then they make other choices. I learned what the wrong thing was to do first, so I could make better choices the other way. 
And I, I'm grateful. And as I look back, I'm actually grateful for that. Even though it was so hard at the time, I'm grateful for that. And so that adversity, instead of being a foe, now is a friend. Yeah, no, I got you there. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was going to ask you, like, have you, have you been able to kind of have some sort of relationship with your family after all this? And you've kind of, I mean, you know, made something of yourself and you've changed your reality. You're not like your father. You're, you're doing great things in life. DJ, that's a great question. I think that um, probably the best way to answer it is that um, at age 19, I went to Japan, learned Japanese and actually was a missionary over there in Japan for a couple of years uh, and learned it. But part of being a missionary of uh, the, the mission leaders suggested that you write your family at least once a week. And I thought, you know what, that's, that's, that's probably okay. I can, I think I can do that. And at the time it was handwritten letters. There were, wasn't any email back. Email hadn't been invented yet. There wasn't any of that. There wasn't any, uh, 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 there just wasn't any electronic means to communicate. So it was, it was just the snail mail type of, of writing letters. And so for two years I did that and I thought, you know what? I feel like I've honored my parents in doing this. You know, that fifth commandment of the 10th commandments is to honor your father and mother. And to honor the father and mother, I felt good about doing that, keeping that commandment, so to speak, of, of doing that. And I thought at the end of that, that time frame, is this a good habit or is this a bad habit? And if you acquire a good habit, I would think it'd be obvious that you want to keep that good habit. You want to keep any good habits that you acquire anywhere along the way and then just keep up with those habits. So I, I decided I'm going to keep up with this habit because I wasn't going back to coming back to the United States to live with my parents. My parents are still in Montana, and I was going to California when I came back. And so I thought, I can keep this up. I can write my parents once a week. And so I did it actually for 32 years. So in, in the answer to your question of repairing the relationship with them, I felt like that single-handedly was probably the biggest thing that repaired any relationship, that any phrase of the relationship that we're were in the past. Anything that happened in my childhood now could be ironed out because I started looking at what I was grateful about for them. I mean, I had to have some some uh, copy, some information to be able to to write in the letters. And I was it wasn't most wasn't about me all the time. It was about how grateful I was that you know they taught me what they taught me, adverse or not. Yeah, for sure. I mean. Like one of the things, kind of what you were saying earlier is, you know, trying to find the good in things and, and you can find the good in people because we all, there are people that are really bad and there are people that are really good, but both those people have a little of the opposite in them. It's just sometimes we, it's harder to see because one outweighs the other, especially when it, someone is overwhelmingly evil. It's hard to see any good they did, but sometimes, you know, if, if you really look hard enough, you can see it. It's just sometimes it's so heinous that it's like, oof, can't look there. But, um, yeah, I mean, because there, there are qualities, like I, I've, I, you know, recently repaired my relationship with my father, um, and my dad wasn't maybe nearly as bad as yours, but he was. He had a lot of anger issues. He would yell at times, and, and just eventually when I was a kid, they put me in a room with two lawyers, and they said, who do you want to live with? And I said, my mother, and I haven't seen my father since. Now, I, I'm recently, like, discuss, I, I had him on the podcast, and I've been talking to him off and on. I try to talk to him about once a week on the phone. And, you know, whether it will ever be father and son, probably not, but at least we'll be, we can be good friends. Um, but there was a lot of the things I could, the only things I could see, at least for a while, was just the evil in him. I could never really see the good moments I had. And there was, like, one moment I would hold on to, like, a, a Halloween party that he threw for me. And that kind of was like the beginning of it. Like, oh, okay, he did have that. And okay, he did buy me any toy I want. And, you know, he did do this, he did do that. Yes, he, he was a little lackluster in certain departments, but he really wasn't the worst father in the world. He didn't molest me or he didn't really physically abuse me. Just sometimes verbally he would say the wrong thing and he would get drunk and things like that. Maybe wasn't the greatest example of a father figure at the time, but it doesn't mean he's, you know, alternately just a bad person. Um, 
so yeah, I, I kind of know what you mean because it, it, it's it, it's good that you kind of made that like olive branch, even if it was something small, just writing letters. It kind of added up to something because you're doing it every year and every week, and and now they're and doing... I cherish, yeah, absolutely. I, I cherish those letters too. I've got fifteen hundred letters. They both my both my father and mother passed away now, so it, it becomes all that more important to be able to have that know that I've got that dialogue. They didn't have the 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 discipline or the uh, uh, the ability or whatever you want to call it to write back every week. So all the letters are not answered, but I do have several very nice answers from my parents that I probably would never have gotten had I not kept that and tried to keep consistent over the 32 year period of you writing a letter um, yeah. every week for, for them. You never talked on the phone or saw them in person? Oh yeah, we talked on the phone, and we I'd see him in person in person as well. Okay. But uh, but yeah, still still, my mother got to the point uh, when she was in her eighties that she she'd tell me, uh, you know, what day of the week she expected the letter. <laughs> it was like uh -huh. clockwork. I said, "Mom, I didn't know you did that." It was like every Thursday she expected that letter in her mailbox, and I, I mailed it on Sunday. I wrote him on Sunday, and I I mail it and. Uh, and apparently it gets there by Thursday and every Thursday she'd be, she'd be just corralling that mailbox trying to find a letter. So I'm glad that she told me that because I had no idea the effect that it might've had on them. I just thought this is a good habit. This is an easy way for me to honor my parents. And what, no matter what the effect is, I didn't have any expectation, any expectation that they'd write back, any expectation that they'd like it, any expectation of anything. And then it turned out that it really kind of became something habitual that they wanted. Uh, mm -hmm. That she was, she was right there uh, when the mailman put the mail in the mailbox on Thursday. She, she wanted to to have that opportunity to grab the letter hot off the press. So they eventually like relayed mo uh, emotions of guilt and you know sorrow and just you know that they, they felt bad for what they did. I think that dissolved is what happened. Um, as far as as far as feeling bad, I think yeah, absolutely. My my mother, I, I could tell there's some some remorse, but it's that was the generation, PJ. Of, of they didn't really talk about that sort of thing, and it, and they didn't talk a lot about about a lot of things, but it was just, you know, that was that was the uh, the emotion of the moment, and you react on the emotion of the moment. So what subsequently happened happened to me and what. Uh, well, what really made me want to turn turn the corner myself is those flashes of anger started to define me, and so even though I, it happened, it happened very intermittently, maybe very rarely, I don't know. But whenever it happened, it was that was a moment that was highly remembered by my children as well as myself, and then. It was almost like holding your breath until the next flash, and because if because of that uh, that mind that mind uh, trick on the in the mind or something that happens that way, it would it would sew the two events together so that it would seem like I was always angry when it really wasn't so, and I'm sure that's that that's what I've done with my own father and my own mother. It, it would seem like every Friday or every Friday night or every Saturday morning, I'd get a whip it. And it, I'm sure it wasn't exactly like that, but it just seemed that those flashes are sewn together because that's the, the high point of emotion. That's the high point of, of what you're watching for. Now you're not watching for the kindness. You're watching for those high points. And unfortunately as a child, that's, that's what uh, was what abusive. Cause I'd, I'd have to, just kind of dodge between those between those emotional uh, uh, those emotional upset moments and uh, try to try to avoid the the wrath. Yeah, and sometimes we remember things as a kid. Like we we remember them for one or two emotions, one or two feelings, and yeah, when you when you're old enough to kind of understand what the other side of things, and you're able to open your mind to what else, what other possibilities are. When you're a kid, you're kind of one or two dimensional you don't really know much but the older you get the more you learn more life experiences you have 
and you can look at certain things. Even even if there was a lot of bad experience, there are probably times maybe you did you did deserve a beating. I don't know, but maybe not to the extent. But you maybe did something that was you know heinous or something that was awful in their eyes, and you acted out and they hit you. Um, you know, because there's a lot of kids these days that probably should be hit for some of the dumb things they do. Um, but you know, we're in a different time now where that's kind of frowned upon. But um, TJ, I have a really good opinion of myself. I think I was a great kid. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, yeah. Of course, of course I do. You know, uh, and in my eyes, I, I think I was okay. But but in the eyes of somebody else, I wasn't. So it's just a matter of reality. You know, it's just we are our own reality. I guess. Sure. Uh, one of the things you did reach out to me about, and we didn't talk about yet. Can you talk a little bit about like the bullying you went through? The bullying, yeah. Yeah. So, so the, it was just um, it was the same thing that, that a lot of kids go through. That uh, for me in, in school, uh, I was just kind of a, a weakling type of, of kid. So in seventh grade, I remember remember taking gymnastics, trying to strengthen my upper body and everything. And in the eighth grade, uh, I was on the junior high or the middle school team to to do the pommel horse and, and that sort of thing. So I tried to, to just develop my upper body. But while I was a skinny kid, kids are so mean. You know, I remember one, one time, and it was, probably was in, uh, I think it was third grade, because in third grade I, I started at one school, and then the teacher got pregnant, and then the school closed down and got trans- kids were transferred to another school. And at that time, you know, the kids are just, uh, they're not very accepting, or at least they weren't at the time for me. And the last day of the school comes, and they threatened me that after school or the last day of school, because these kids would not get in trouble from the principal or anybody else, they knew they could beat up anybody they wanted to. So they threatened me with that, that they're going to beat me up after the last day of school. I was so terrified from that type of rhetoric from these, these kids that I thought were my friends that I faked sick and I uh, just decided not to even go to school uh, on the last day of school. So it was just it's one of those things that I, I wanted to avoid it. Just like, just like when I was a kid, and that's why I think I was actually a pretty good kid, because I really, all this abuse helped me to try to avoid trouble, be, to avoid any, any situation where I might get in trouble, where there might be a punishment, where there might be some, something hazardous that might come to my heart or soul or body. And I just, uh, just tried to be a peaceable human being from, as an adverse effect of, of the abuse from being a child. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I went through a lot of bullying and, and being beat up a little bit when I was like a really early kid, like kindergarten in that area. But um, yeah, because I do remember vividly, like in ninth grade, you know, they had this thing on uh, Friday the 13th, which would be considered freshman day. And they would just beat up the freshmen. And I remember a lot of people I knew were beat up and thrown up in trash cans and Somehow I kind of avoided it, and I don't know, I can't really exactly remember why, but I know I was kind of cool with some of the other kids, and I don't know, I wasn't, I didn't stand out enough, and but I, I found ways to kind of tiptoe around the, the booby traps or the, the landmines. Like, I, I just find, I knew how to kind of navigate the, the landscape without really triggering anybody to want to hurt me. Um, so I kind of understand it to a certain degree because, yeah, like you, you get yelled at enough and you have enough happen to you. Like you're just trying to be good enough so things don't turn on you. It's it's just, um, you know, you're, you're walking around in your house that's full of creeks and you're trying not to step on that one board that's going to wake somebody up. You're like, nope, I'm going. Yeah. To, no, exactly. You know what? My, my wife right now is just amazed how quiet I am. I get up in the morning long before she does. And then how quiet I am when I go to bed, how quiet I am when she's taking a nap. I remember being totally yelled at if I woke my mother up. And you did not want to wake that sleeping bear. It's just, you just don't do that. Yeah. And so, I, I, yeah, you figure that out soon enough. Um, here, here's like an interesting question because, you know, you talked about like trying to, to find someone to be with, but, you know, and knowing what wasn't love, but you actually now found love now that you're married and you have a wife. Like, did you, how, 
soon on did you know that like this is what love is? I think that periodically throughout our life, we have people that are genuinely kind to us. And I think that for the most part, people do try to be kind. And I remember just incidences um, and, and it just never dawned on me. It, uh, probably the, uh, the paradigm shift happened in that incident that I talked about, about this taking that lady to my sister and sister-in-law and brother's house. That helped me understand what part of the spectrum I was on, TJ. And I think it's really important to understand spectrum when you're talking about any any uh, any uh, improvement that you're going to have in your own life. What's the spectrum? Just take, for example, just the word sarcasm. And 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 on on a night naughty spectrum or on a nice spectrum, where does sarcasm fit? And to me, it fits on the naughty side of the spectrum. It's kind of a naughty thing to be sarcastic about something. So, what would be the opposite of sarcasm on the nice end of the spectrum? And to me, that would be more genuine or authentic. So, I started. I think the transformation for me was to help. Help me make those transitions. Find out, well, where am I on the naughty and nice spectrum? Where does this particular uh, character attribute, or where does this set of, of of skills fit? Once you find that, once you find where you're at on that spectrum, you've got three choices: you can stay put, you can go to the left, or you can go to the right, and you can be more naughty. Or you can be more nice. And I started figuring out that where I was on that anger and love spectrum was I was closer to ang- anger. And my and my sister-in-law proved the fact when I got angry at what she just did to someone that I cared about, someone that I was dating. And so I was on the angry side. I thought, I've got to get out of this. On the angry side or on, in any one of those spectrums, naughty versus nice, there's a vocabulary that goes with it. There's a sense of humor that goes with it. There's just all these mannerisms that go with it. It's changing the whole set. It's a whole paradigm shift. You're going to have to learn a new language. If you've got an angry language now, you're going to have to new, learn the love languages. And that's, that's what this dice has been very helpful with me is that now I know the languages of love. I know how when people react that they light up, that's what they like. I don't have to give them a survey and say, TJ, I'm going to give you this survey so I know how to love you. I don't have to do that. That's just so awkward. All I have to do is watch them. Just do, use your observation. Watch them. They'll light up. And when they light up, that's what they like. Just take a mental note that that's what they like. Yeah. No, but I mean, did, did you figure that out before or after you met your wife? Because like, you actually found true love. You're married and you're you know, happily married. So was that something you found before you met her or after? Well, the real, the real answer to that, TJ, is this is my third wife. Okay. So I, I have, I have the privilege of having a, a favorite ex, ex-wife because you can't have a favorite if you only have one. Right. You can have a favorite if you have two or more. Sure. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. just, I'm just, just playing, you know, so this is my third wife. So it's taken me that long and, and the ups and downs of, three different marriages to get me to here. Uh, I, I, I feel like I've, I've made a lot of progress and, that, and this, this is a good wife right now. Well, yeah, that's all that matters as long as you're making progress. So it's, you don't want to constantly going backwards. It's, Absolutely. We're here to make progress. Yeah. That's why I always talk about like the quick thing theory is always taking at least two steps forward and one step backward. You're going to eventually fall back at some point, but as long as you kind of regain your footing and then you, your next time around, you, you take two steps forward. I mean, you're still going Absolutely. forward. It's just, it just doesn't seem like it because you're only taking one step extra. But, you know, you're still getting there. You're still moving. And That's, Absolutely. That's the whole learning process. And everybody's got to go through it. So let's be a little bit more kind. As everybody has to go through it, we're not the only ones. We're not the only ones that have problems. Everybody's got problems. We can help be a, a light and a encouragement to other people we don't have to be danny downer or or uh we don't have to do that we just don't have to do it yeah. it's better to better to lift them up for sure and what was what was the inspiration behind the app 
the application. So the application is the dice. So it's not an app on the phone or anything like that. Oh, okay. So when I say good application, it's just it's a, it's a dice. So it's just a, a new way to express the love languages, a new way to practice them. And so it's 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 quite a bit different. Uh, Dr. Chapman would have you do it only to your significant other. To me, that's a part-time job, and let me tell you why. You are not around your significant other people all day long, 24-7. You're not. So that's just a part-time job. You're only doing it when you're around them. What if you forget? So to avoid that forgetting, develop the mindset of, that, of determination that you're going to love. You're going to send it out all day long all day 24 7 there are no vacations there's no retirement all day long you're going to be doing this love thing all day long and when you do that you're going to come home you're going to love at work you're going to come home and you're going to love at home and it's just it's just a better lifestyle it's just that's i think that's just going to be the impetus that helps people overcome the the emotional depression because they know that there's someone out there, absolutely someone out there that will lift them up. And that's your lifeline. You call that lifeline to help you out. Now, if somebody wants one of these dice, how do they get a hold of you and uh, obtain one? So the die is on my website. I've written a book about this as well. It's called The Role of Love, R-O-L-E. So I used to play on words. R-O-L-L is for rolling the die. R-O-L-E changes you within. So R-O-L-E is the website, R-O-L-E-of-love.com, and they can find the dice, the book. There's a journal as well if they want to keep track of what they rolled, what opportunities they saw to love in that way that day, and then what they did without those opportunities. Who wouldn't have loved to have a love journal like that from your mother or your father or grandmother or grandfather? I mean, it was just one of these love legacy journals that would just be passed through generations. This is how my grandfather loved. It's a much better journal than the weather. Who cares about what the weather was 60 years ago? I don't. So it's just one of those things that you'll pass on from generation to generation. Yeah. No, I'm always fascinated on how people come up with all these different methods. And again, some things are for certain people and some things aren't. But, you know, there are people that it will help. And I, I'm always, like I said, intrigued by how uh, someone gets to the place they got to through you know, they use their pain, turn it into something positive and, uh, you know, and then they help people with it. And that's always the, the best way. And, you know, I've found so many people are doing that. And it's just, it, like I said, I'm always at all in, in all of, of people like that. So I'm glad you're doing what you're doing, trying to help others. Well, thank you. Thank you, TJ. And it's just absolutely been a pleasure to visit with you about this. And I'm, I'm anxious to share this with others. It, it changed my life. And it will change your life as well. And it's a, uh, it's just one of those, one of those games. In fact, you can call the dice the game. It's one of those games that everybody wins. Who doesn't like to win games? I don't know anybody that doesn't like to win. Yeah, I don't know anyone who doesn't either. If they do. They're they're very strange. They sabotage yeah. themselves. I mean, pe- people <laughs> do that in real life, but I don't know about in games. Yeah. Um. But yeah, buddy. I thank you for for coming on. You have any social media? Anything you want to promote? You can find social media contacts on my website, okay. uh, again, rolloflove.com. Uh, if you are one of those people that really doesn't like the reading of a book, but you like to listen to the book, I've got an audible of the book as well. And that's, you can find the audible. It's best to search under my name, Paul Zolman, Z-O-L-M-A-N, mm-hmm. because if you type in Roll of Love, you're going to get Love This, Love That, Love a Million Times. If you type in Paul Zolman, you'll be able to get right to the book and to the the Audible version. And if you're on Audible on Amazon, then the book's free. So, yeah, awesome. just no, no reason why you can't have the book in your hand. That's awesome. Well, good luck, buddy. I appreciate what you're doing, and um, I'm happy what you turned into. You turned into a great guy through, through all you've been Thank through. Thank you, TJ. Thank you so much, and I appreciate the time that you spent here, and God bless you, and let's Let's find people that will lift you up, too. Yeah, same here, buddy. Please keep in touch. We'll do it. All right, brother. Thanks so much. Yep. All right. Bye. Bye. All right, guys. Another one down. On to the next, I suppose. Uh, 
for those who've probably listened to me long enough and you probably can tell I'm not in a, <sighs> the most chipper mood. I'm just dealing with my own shit and just running into a lot of dead ends and um, I'm trying to make changes in my life and I don't know how to go about that. So, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll get out of this mode, this mood, I should say mode and mood, but um, I'm just kind of just exhausted mentally and physically and just I'm trying to you know, succeed in life, and I feel like every time I try, I get kicked in the face, but, um, either way, like I said, I enjoy talking to him, good guy, and, uh, I hope everyone's doing better than I am, in any way, I just, I do, I, you know, I really, really hope everyone out there is, is okay, um, I know that's, you know, probably fool's gold to think that, but I really do hope everyone's okay, um, you know, especially the people who listen to the show and people who have different ailments, disabilities, and, and all homelessness and all the things we cover. I just hope someone finds some sort of peace of mind and finds a place that they, they fit in. And, you know, they're not dealing with a lot of their trials and tribulations alone because it's, it's much harder. Um, but, you know, as you can see from the guest on the show, they, they find ways to turn it around and, and make something of themselves. So please, uh, please keep fighting. Hang on to whatever it is that you're hanging on to hang in there and and just stay strong all right all right guys i'll see you guys on the next episode and thank you for uh being here with me thanks guys bye